They shot him because he was black, so his dad took revenge. Racism moment. We open with a scene of cops pulling over a black man and his 14-year-old son simply because the boy has his phone out and is recording. They would end up deleting the kid, as a year later, a student filmmaker, Jordan King, is interviewing the father, Lincoln, about what happened to his son, KJ. Jordan is telling him the interview will primarily be seen by his classmates and professors, but there's a possibility of it going to festivals, so it could eventually be seen by the entire world. The interview starts with Lincoln showing a really cute and funny family video recorded by KJ. After that, he starts describing what happened on the 3rd of July the previous year, the day his son was clapped. The date is pretty significant. I'm sure you know why. Up next, Lincoln's young and beautiful mom joins the interview another day, and we find out that she helped raise KJ. She talks about how her son served in the military in Iraq, and how it makes what the cops did to her grandson that much worse. She also talks about how KJ reacted when his parents split, and how the boy became all that Lincoln had. Then, she said something about how all the young boys in this neighborhood get beat up by cops, or worse, all the time. But KJ wasn't even in that neighborhood when he was clapped. He was on his way back from visiting one of his white friends in a richer neighborhood when him and his father got stopped by the police. At this point, we take a break from the interview and we see KJ being recorded by his dad on his first day at school. KJ is talking about how his new school feels like a Key and Peele skit. Apparently, they play around and rap on the speakers during lunch. Where the hell was this when I was in high school? I had bars, I swear. We're back to the interview now and you can tell it's a different story. Lincoln is with the interview kid in KJ's room and he's now talking about how the split with his wife affected KJ. Apparently, coming back from two tours in Iraq really affected his life in the real world. He was also really connected with his roots. He was into Malcolm and the Black Panthers. But when it came to the police, he had a totally different understanding from the average black citizen. We flash back to a scene where KJ is on a video call with his friend Jonah, and he's telling Jonah that, according to the law, one can actually fight back when being aroused by cops. His father heard that and just had to step in. KJ is still trying to quote the law, so his dad shuts him up and gives him and his friend a little lecture of what it means to be a black man in America. He tells him that those laws may exist, but they weren't written for people that look like him. This says a lot about society. He tells him, when you're dealing with the police, you don't think of laws. You don't think of rights. You just do whatever they say their way. Next, Lincoln takes Jordan to work. Apparently, he got a job at the school in order to get his son in, but he says he continued working there a year and a half after his son's death because, well, it's his life now. In the next scene, Jordan is now talking with this guy whom Lincoln served in the military with. Apparently, this guy has cancer and after doing chemo once, he's not interested in doing it again. This brother is really being an alpha male and standing up to cancer. You gotta respect it. Anyway, while they're still talking, Lincoln comes in all dressed up for court. They're going for the grand jury decision and they're optimistic. In front of the courthouse, while African-American protesters are screaming for justice for KJ, some three white folks are shouting, back the blue on the side. The decision, the decision, I can't, oh god. The decision finally comes out, and heartbreakingly, but also unsurprisingly, the ground jury found no probable cause to file any charges against the murdering officer. He'll be resuming service like normal. This is all too familiar. KJ's mom is freaking out outside the courthouse while his dad pulls it together until he gets home. At home, he's puking, punching the walls. Anyway, that decision made by the grand jury led to chaos in the city that night. Buildings being burned, cop cars being smashed, properties being vandalized, absolute chaos. It was so bad that a cop was sent to KJ's mom to try and get her to make a statement to the public so the violence can stop. But KJ's cousin is having none of that. He's recording with his phone and asking the cop to get out of the house. He only stops for a bit when his auntie asks him to, but he sparks up yet again when the cop says some stuff about not being able to change the past. He's really going off now and he keeps recording and giving the cops a piece of his mind, even though the officer is raising his voice telling him to calm down. He tells the cops to leave his house and fortunately, they do. That's an alpha male right there. Anyway, KJ's mom eventually does the press conference the police asked for. She's asking the people to stop the violence, but Lincoln's friend, watching on TV, doesn't like that at all. He's not mad at the mom, though. He's mad at the system. Now we see a few throwbacks of little KJ, and then Lincoln and the interview crew in the car. Apparently, Tiana, KJ's mom, filed a petition to get the police chief dismissed. Lincoln tells Jordan they're headed to the courthouse, but in truth, they're headed to the greatest show of their lives. Lincoln asks Jordan to take over the steering, then he goes into a house. After some minutes, he comes out with that same police officer who was at Tiana's house. He forces the cop into the car, and they drive off. They're now at a place where Lincoln links up with some of his other military friends and they're getting strapped up. One of the interview kids gets frightened and calls 911, but Lincoln quickly grabs her phone and smashes it, gives them bulletproof rests, and tells them not to stop filming at any point. These kids are about to make the greatest documentary ever. Now, they're all in the back of a bus. Machine guns everywhere. Surely one of them has to be named Kelly. Anyway, from the bus, they get into a police station and boom, a shootout. But Lincoln tells the police officers that if they keep shooting, he'll off their captain. The captain also shouts orders at them and they hold their fire. The cops drop their weapon and put their hands in the air as more police backup arrives outside the station. Then, Lincoln gets a one-on-one -on -one with the cop who clapped his son in a separate room. He's sitting across from him now, and the cop is saying he didn't mean to clap him. Now, Lincoln pulls out his semi-automatic, points it to the cop, and asks him if he's scared, if he's thinking of his family at that moment, if he's thinking about how he's too young to die. Of course, the cop doesn't answer. But seeing how agitated Lincoln is getting, Jordan tells Lincoln to calm down, saying this won't solve anything and it'll only make things worse. Lincoln eventually gets up and leaves. He's squatting outside the room when his homeboy comes and tells him the phones have been ringing nonstop. He goes to answer the phone,
phone and introduces himself as the person in charge and the father of the boy who was taken out by the cops on the 3rd of July last year. He says everyone is fine and then when the person on the other end of the phone asks what he wants, he repeatedly says he wants his son and they should call him back when they have KJ. Then he repeatedly smashes the phone. Now we see the little film crew arguing. The girl wants to run away but the guys think that's stupid considering there are too many machine guns involved. Lincoln now gets a call from Tiana who's asking him to just come back home because he's all that she has that connects her to her son. She asks him to come back so they can start over. He argues for a bit but while he's still trying to do some convincing, the police cut off his connection. A negotiator talks to Lincoln for a bit and after the call, Lincoln gives instructions to round everyone up and tie them to the desks. He then gives a little speech about why he's here. Essentially, he's here for justice. He says Officer Randall, who made his son stop living, will be tried right here in the station. Lincoln goes and brings in some non-violent offenders who are being held at the station to act as the jury. And one of the cops is defending Randall. While he's addressing the jury, Lincoln is asked what he'll do if they find the cop guilty and he says he doesn't know yet. Anyway, court is now in session. The two cops who were involved in the shooting that night narrated the story from their respective perspectives, but Randall was cut off when he referred to KJ as the deceased. Lincoln insists that the officer referred to his son by his name, Kajani Jefferson. Anyway, as the story continues, Randall says he, in fact, saw that KJ was reaching for his phone and not a gun, but they're taught not to de-escalate. According to him, once a gun is drawn, it's drawn. Okay, that's a wild rule for law enforcement agency if you ask me. Now, we're taken back to what exactly happened in those seconds leading up to KJ being shot. Lincoln then asks what happened after the shooting, and Randall says he went home immediately after because that's protocol. After shooting, you go home and wait for your superiors to arrive. Anyone else think these are pretty crazy protocols? Just me? At this point, the defense lawyer cop says some BS that KJ might have been alive if Lincoln wasn't speeding and had the proper insurance card, at which point a member of the jury interjects asking, what kind of bullshit justification is that? Took the words right out of my mouth. The cop thinks it's crazy that a member of the jury is speaking, but Lincoln said, right here, anybody can speak. It's not the way it works in the court of law, but that's how it's going to work in the court of Lincoln. Respect. Perhaps we can call him Oprah Link Free, because here, you get a voice, you get a voice, you get a voice, everyone gets a voice. So more people brought up good points and questions. The other cop who was present at the crime scene talked about black on black crimes and how they don't get as much media coverage as police killings. But a member of the jury shuts that down by saying this exactly. Nobody talks about white on white or yellow on yellow crime. So why is there a thing like black on black? I for one, don't see color. I'm, col I'm colorblind. But things get even worse when the topic switches to slavery. One of the cops says, the slavery thing is a cop out. No pun intended. It happened. Get over it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow your roll, Yeezy. Not cool. A member of the jury asked if he'd say the same thing about what happened in Germany. I can't say the name, but you know what I'm talking about. And a female cop asked if he'll say the same about women's rights, but he says it's not the same. He turns and asks her if she's taking their side now, but she says she's taking her side. She says she's been through a lot in the force as a Latina woman. Surprisingly, the cold-hearted cop emphasizes with her and the uh, Germany victims. But before you give him a gold star, this guy is still racist because he still refuses to empathize with black people. A jury member points out his racism, but his fellow cop defends him by saying that they're not part of any racist groups. Lincoln's homeboy questions his logic and boom, he hits us with a racist favorite line. I don't see color. Oh shit. <clears throat> Moving on. A jury member asks the exact question on my lips. You colorblind? Oh, there's my punchline. But to defend himself, this guy digs himself deeper into a hole. He now says he hasn't met many racist cops and it is impossible for him and his fellow officers at that precinct to be racist because they have a black captain. Oh, this is like when someone says they have black friends. And he's immediately hit with a rebuttal from a jury member. That's like saying it's impossible to be sexist if you're married to a woman. Okay, these prisoners are really smart. How did you get caught when you're this smart, bro? I mean, these guys are basically schooling the cops about how society's programming is really everything. But this cop just keeps going. He's saying a lot of the things black people have to deal with are based on the way black people act. He's even now bringing rap lyrics into it. Bro, leave hip hop out of this. Now this other cop is basically calling black people and Latinas thugs. But ironically, he's the one who stands up being aggressive when a jury member tells him in Spanish that he's crushing his own people. He's now taking a dig at the tattoos. Man, absolutely nothing is safe from this police officer. He's quite literally ready to take shots at anything and anyone. The next officer is basically now saying nothing is about race, but just about class and education. So Lincoln asks him why he can't send his daughters to public schools and now he's quiet. Lincoln says private schools are built like colleges while public schools are built like prisons. Yeah, I think we can all attest to that one. And with the public schools being predominantly black, it's definitely a race problem. He's now talking about how he worked hard to take his son out of where he was and put him in a place where he could survive. That still didn't save him because of the color of his skin. Then Randall had the guts to ask, why couldn't he have just complied? He says if his people took a second to think in situations like that, they wouldn't be victims. Man, the racism in this room is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Lincoln replies by saying if officers took a second to 
think, then maybe there'd be a lot less accidental killings. But Randall says he didn't mean to take out KJ. He's saying he was scared and just did what he was trained to do when he was scared. Kill and go home. That's some crazy training, I won't lie. Lincoln is now showing everyone a picture of KJ and saying he wants justice. Now, the officer acting as a defense lawyer is trying to blame Lincoln for the death of his son, saying KJ died because he broke the law. But the crazy thing is that none of the officers can say at what exact speed Lincoln was going, even though they stopped him for speeding. But Lincoln remembers, and he narrates it to everybody. Randall finally cracks under pressure and says it wasn't because of the speed that he stopped Lincoln. It was because, as a black man, he didn't fit in that white neighborhood, and he looked suspicious. He loudly agreed that he profiled Lincoln and his son, and he's now saying that that's the cost of keeping citizens safe in America. He's in tears now. The room is quiet for a bit. Then out of nowhere, a jury member who has been quiet all day rushes at an officer who has also been quiet. He lands a good three to four punches on the cop before he's held. Apparently, that cop took him in on fake charges. Then, while one of Lincoln's men is trying to help the cop get up, the cop grabs the man's gun and shoots at him. Yet another cop shooting a black man. America moment. Lincoln and his homeboy want to get him out and get him help, but Uncle says he ain't going nowhere. The captain is now asking Lincoln to end this because nothing good can come of it. Jordan seconds. The defense lawyer says since the 12th juror, the inmate who attacked the cop, is gone, the court session has to end. Lincoln thinks for a bit and then instructs Jordan to replace the 12th juror, even though he says he can't. He tells him, vote your conscience, take as much time as you need. His friend reiterates that, and defense lawyer cop says, remember what's at stake here, just before he leaves to join the rest of the jurors. It's now time to vote. The black people vote guilty, and the white people vote not guilty, but Jordan doesn't vote at all. Then an argument breaks out. Each party is making their case. Jordan is quiet until the foreman asks him to say something. Then he starts narrating his story of how he grew up middle class and had an uncle who was a cop, and as far as he knows, a good man, so he's a little conflicted. He says he can't categorically say that Randall woke up that morning and planned to clap a kid, nor can he say for sure that the incident was racially motivated, but he was moved that nothing in the precinct acknowledges the death of KJ. Meanwhile, there's a lot of stickers and banners saying back the blue, support the police, and stuff like that. He's now giving a lecture about great nations not being great because they kill, but because they heal, not because they oppress, but because they liberate. He's now in tears talking about how he's tired of hearing about black people being killed by cops, and how supposedly the cop did the right thing no matter the circumstances, and he thinks that holding Randall accountable for what he did could serve as a lesson to other cops out there. Eventually, the jury finds Randall guilty, and he's now forced to kneel in front of Lincoln, who asks him to video call his wife and kid. He basically says his goodbyes and hangs up. The place goes quiet for a bit and straight up chaos when Lincoln pulls out his revolver and points it at Randall. He pulls the trigger, but there's no bullet in the gun. He just wanted Randall to feel what he has been feeling for the past one year. Randall is now in tears apologizing. Jordan thinks it's a miracle that no cops died, but Lincoln tells him that that was the plan all along. Jordan then asks, so all of this was to make the cops see? But Lincoln replies, no, it was to make the world see. At that very moment, Jordan discovered his entire purpose. Everything is now returned to how it was. Cops are untied and let go while the inmates are cuffed and led back into their cells. There are hugs and handshakes and Randall comes up to Lincoln and asks to walk out with him, not as an enemy. He agrees. So, they're in a single file now, all of them with their hands in the air. The filming kids are in front, then Randall, then Lincoln. Randall is screaming that he's with Lincoln and they're all unarmed. But before he even finishes his statement, Lincoln is shot and put to sleep by the police officers outside. Like that wasn't crazy enough, the news channel started making things up about Lincoln. They're saying he was suffering from a mental illness, that he was a criminal, all sorts of crazy things. And after all that, we see Jordan wrap up the greatest documentary ever and go to submit it. Moral of the story? This did not feel like a movie, and that is a problem. Oh hey, just me again begging for subscribers. Uh, we're almost at a million and the year's almost up. Let's do it.